Before we get into today's video, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Morgan & Morgan. You know, life can take unexpected turns, especially when it comes to accidents and injuries. When you find yourself facing such challenges, it's crucial to know where to turn to for help. That's where Morgan & Morgan steps in. With over three decades of fighting for people just like you and me, They've shown time and time again that they're not afraid to stand up to insurance companies to make sure you get what you deserve. Morgan & Morgan has secured verdicts and settlements that far exceed the initial insurance offers, transforming lives with the compensation their clients need and deserve. But it's not just about numbers, it's about the commitment to each individual case. The understanding that behind every case is a person's life, hopes, and dreams. Checking if you have a case is quick, easy, and free. You don't have to pay a penny unless you win. That's right. Morgan & Morgan fights for you on a contingency basis. So if you're facing a tough situation and need someone in your corner, consider reaching out to America's largest injury law firm. You can start your claim with just a click at www.forthepeople.com slash Donovan Dread. It's time to get the support you deserve. Today we're diving deep into something that's going to make you question every shadow you see in the woods. We're talking real encounters, the kind that come from the very people we trust to keep us safe, police officers. And this isn't just hearsay. We got this straight from the horse's mouth. This encounter happened in Minnesota, land of 10,000 lakes, dense forests, and apparently strange creatures that walk straight out of legends and into our reality. Our story begins with the local police officer, Officer Jensen, who has been on the force for over a decade. Born and raised in the heart of Minnesota, Jensen grew up with a deep appreciation for the great outdoors. As a kid, he spent his days exploring the dense forests and sprawling lakes that make up the state's unique landscape. This early exposure to nature instilled in him not just a respect for the environment, but also a curiosity about the mysteries it might hold. After high school, Jensen found himself at a crossroads, with a strong sense of duty and a desire to give back to the community that raised him. He was drawn to a career in law enforcement. He saw it as a way to protect and serve the place he called home. So, he enrolled in the police academy excelling in his studies and physical training. His instructors saw potential in him, not just for his physical abilities, but for his keen observational skills and level-headedness in stressful situations, which came to be very important, as you will soon hear about. Upon graduating from the academy, Jensen returned to his hometown, eager to make a difference. He quickly became known as a dedicated and reliable officer, one who treated everyone with respect and fairness. Over the years, he worked his way up the ranks, earning the trust of his colleagues and the community. But despite his success, he continued to spend his free time hiking, camping, and exploring the wilderness areas that surrounded his town. He didn't want to leave that part of himself behind. Jensen believed in facts and evidence, in the things you could see and touch. His experiences in law enforcement had shown him the darker sides of humanity, but they had also reinforced his belief in the goodness of people. He was skeptical of the supernatural and unexplained, always looking for the logical explanation behind every report of strange sightings or occurrences. However, that was soon to change. One evening, he's called out to a disturbance on the outskirts of town, nestled right up against thick woods, the kind of place where the biggest crime is usually someone's cat getting into another person's garbage. So, Jensen's thinking it's probably just some teenagers messing around, right? Wrong. He arrives to find a group of campers, and these folks are scared out of their minds. They're talking about seeing a giant figure, covered in hair, walking on two legs, and disappearing into the trees. Jensen assumes it's probably a bear sighting, but the campers are insistent. Bears don't stand over eight feet tall, and they don't walk like a man. Intrigued and a bit skeptical of how strange this is all sounding, Jensen decides to investigate. He heads into the woods, flashlight in hand, expecting to find nothing but the sign of wild animals. But as he goes deeper, he notices something off. Broken branches at a height no deer or bear could reach. 
larger branches that would be difficult to break, and footprints, huge footprints that just dwarfed any he'd ever seen before. That's when he stops to look around and listen. That's when he hears it, this low grumbling sound that he can't pinpoint. It's not quite animal, not quite human. Jensen pauses, his hand instinctively resting on the butt of his service pistol, though he has no real intention of using it. It's more a comfort than anything, a reminder of the reality that a police officer's gun isn't meant for the things that go bump in the night. He strains his ears, trying to hear the noise better, to try and find the pattern that tells him if it's animal or wind or nothing to worry about. But the answer doesn't come to him. The sound, though, it does come again, and it's closer this time, a guttural tone that hangs heavy in the cold night air. Jensen's mind races with all the wilderness safety he's ever studied, every bit of training he's had. But nothing in those pages, nothing in those lectures, prepares him for what is about to happen. He is sweating profusely at this point and is in danger of losing his concentration. He flicks his flashlight from side to side, piercing the darkness with a beam of light that seems too weak for what he needs it to be right now. He thinks of the campers, their faces covered with fear, and he now understands. This is not just another night on the job. This is not a bear. This is something else entirely. Taking a deep breath, Jensen steps forward. Each crunch of his boot on the underbrush seems impossibly loud. He's aware of the weight of his body cam on his shoulder. He makes a mental note to ensure it's recording. The grumbling grows in intensity, a low sound that vibrates through the soles of his shoes and into his bones. He can almost feel it in his teeth. And then, it suddenly stops. The silence that follows is complete and far more terrifying than when he was hearing the sounds. Jensen's body chill turns into a shiver that he can't control. It's the quiet that gets to you, the not knowing. The unseen is always more frightening than the seen. These are the situations that separate the rookies from the professionals. In training, they teach you about these situations to help you get through them and stay alive. Then there's a snap of a twig and a deliberate heavy step. Jensen's flashlight beam catches a glimpse of movement, a shadow within the shadows, a form that's too big to belong in this world. His heart thumps against his ribcage as he watches it disappear. He thinks of calling it in, but what would he say? Dispatch, I've got a possible, Bigfoot, Sasquatch? No, Jensen's a man of evidence. He can't call this in, not yet. He needs more to go on so as not to look like he's falling apart. So he moves not away from the sound, but towards it. It's what he does, what he's always done. He faces the thing that scares him because that's how you keep others safe. That's how you find the truth. But with each step, the reality he knows, the world of speeding tickets and domestic disputes fades a little more. He's stepping into the unbelievable and unknown. He's close now, so close he can almost see it. The outline of something massive, covered in fur with eyes that reflect the flashlight's beam like a cat's. It's standing in a small clearing just beyond a thicket of brush. The creature is immense, towering over him, the top of its silhouette nearly blending with the lower branches of the trees. Its fur is thick and matted, varying shades of dark brown and black, almost like the bark of the trees surrounding it. The eyes are the most unsettling feature intelligent, piercing, an intense yellow that seems to burn with their own inner light. The body of the creature is robust, muscles rolling under the fur with every shift of its weight. Its arms hang long and powerful by its sides, ending in hands, or are they paws, that seem capable of terrifying strength. The thing's legs are sturdy, built for standing erect, for walking as a man might but there's a roughness to them that speaks of a life spent roaming the dense underbrush. Now here's where things get really interesting. Jensen has his body cam running, the thing we all wish we had when we tell our own unbelievable stories. And for a brief moment, he catches it, a massive figure, covered in hair, standing at the edge of the flashlight's beam before it vanishes into the darkness. Jensen rushes forward to capture more of this creature on camera. But by the time he gets to where the figure was standing, it's gone. 
All that's left is a set of insanely large footprints that lead deeper into the woods, footprints he decides not to follow. It's one thing to chase a suspect through familiar streets, and quite another to trail a cryptid into the depths of the woods. The trek back feels longer than it should, a twisted path through a world that now has him totally confused. When he finally emerges from the tree line, the sight of his cruiser has never been more welcome. He glances back one more time as he gets into his car and drives away surrounded by the safety of the vehicle. Back at the station, Jensen reviews the body cam footage, half expecting to find a logical explanation as to what the creature really was. But there it is, clear as day, and it's something that defies explanation. The footage is shaky and brief, but to him the creature is undeniably there. This story, straight from a police officer, sends ripples through the force. Jensen, who's always been a by-the-book kind of guy, finds himself at the center of a storm of attention with the other officers. Skeptics and believers alike are asking him for more information. But Jensen? He's not interested in talking about it any further and stirring up controversy. He did his duty. He reported what he found, and he left it at that. For this story to make sense, you must know what I do for a living. I study entomology, insects. The pay isn't phenomenal, but it's a field I've been passionate about all my life. I won't force you to read or pronounce my formal title. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. What matters is that I study moths, their diets, their reproductive habits, and their role in pollination. My research has taken me to half a dozen countries and I have studied over 50,000 species of moth. By all accounts, I am an expert. For the account in question, I only needed to travel to Nevada. It was a 10 hour drive from my California home, but I made the most of the wind in the radio. I was expecting the trip to be routine. I was wrong. At the time, I was documenting the relationship between the Tegeticula synthetica and the Joshua trees of the southwestern United States. In Nevada's Tickaboo Valley, two varieties of Joshua trees have come to coexist. To my knowledge, the valley is the only place in the United States where this has occurred. I remain convinced that the Synthetica moths have played a role in the unification of these two tree species. My plan was to travel to the valley, to establish a campsite, and to monitor the presence and behaviors of these moths over the course of three days. I settled on the southern side of Tickaboo Peak, and elected to face my campsite west, toward the sunset. My first night passed without incident. The following afternoon, however, my studies were interrupted. The approaching rumble of an engine announced the intruder's arrival. It was so loud that it instantly grabbed my attention. It was a military-grade truck. On the road, it would have looked out of place, as if it had just slipped out of the Korean War and landed on the highway. On the mountainside, though, the vehicle looked right at home. Two military personnel, I wouldn't call them soldiers, jumped out of the truck and introduced themselves. As they spoke, loud and aggressive, they paced my campsite. They were more interested in my equipment than in what I had to say. I had the necessary paperwork to prove my intentions, of course. I knew that the military's Air Force range was nearby when I agreed to take on this particular study. My documentation seemed to satisfy them. They wearily agreed that I could stay. The nervous glances they exchanged told me that something was amiss. I was more worried about my insects at the time, so I chose not to press them for information. They left and warned me not to document anything occurring beyond the perimeter of my camp. I agreed to those terms. I had enough moss within the immediate area to gather the information I needed. The second night, I saw what they wanted to keep secret. A loud electronic pulse resonated through the area. It shook my equipment and scared away the moths I was watching. At that point, I had no choice but to surrender to my curiosity. I looked to the west and saw that another truck, this one much larger, had parked in the groove between two hills. A long bed was attached to the back of the vehicle. Upon that platform was something that looked like a satellite dish. A red bulb was blinking in its center and after every few beats, another wave of sound radiated from that direction. It was loud but low, like an alarm that was only meant to be felt by my bones. 
This went on for two hours. My research for the night was crippled. Then the light blinked off and in the darkness I lost sight of the vehicle and the satellite. I'm still not sure what that equipment was. I do know, however, that something responded. The next night, the sound came again. This time, when I looked, there was no vehicle hiding between the hills of the desert. There was no light on the ground either. This time, the lights were in the sky. In the distance, a large triangular mass was hovering in the air. It must have been 500 feet above the previous location of the truck and the satellite. Lights were flashing from the corners of the triangle. I thought at first that I was hallucinating. I thought that the darkness was concealing the true nature of the structure in the distance. It couldn't be floating, I said, certainly not without the growl of a motor or the whirring of a blade. But there it was. With each strobe of the red lights, I saw edges of the craft become more defined. It was larger than any vehicle I'd ever seen. A dozen of the military's huge trucks could have parked on the back of the mysterious craft. Like before, after a sequence of lights had concluded, an electronic pulse rippled across the desert. This one was stronger. I heard the sound and a few moments later, I felt the wind push against my hair. I watched the shape for an hour. Then it turned, pointed one of its corners toward the sky and vanished. It blinked out of existence as quickly as the satellite's red light had been turned off the night before. My study, I decided, was over. I left immediately. Instead of finding the open road, I found the military waiting for me. Different personnel this time. More of them, too. They were carrying rifles and not one of them looked glad to see me. They didn't ask where I was headed. They didn't ask what I had seen. Instead, they told me I should leave. They told me the desert air was a little too harsh on my lungs, and that probably the nights were a little too cold to be out there. I told them that was fine, that I was headed home. I hadn't seen a thing. I didn't have a story to tell, except for the one about the moths. I would have agreed to anything to get out of that situation. My reputation was damaged after I failed to complete my research. My study wasn't published. Grants have been much harder to come by. Almost impossible. As I sit here now and watch my career decline, regardless of my undying passion for the work, I find myself asking, why not? Why not tell the story? It isn't anything new. We all know they exist. I guess maybe the shock of it all exists in the rest of that truth, the part they don't want me to tell. Not only do they exist, but they're communicating with us. And shockingly, we are communicating back to them. Hey Donovan, in the brief downtime we get during deployment, your show has been a much needed distraction. You've been asking for listeners' stories, and I think I have a story that you might find interesting. This happened during my last tour overseas. It's something I've kept very quiet due to the nature of my work. I'm a Marine, presently stationed halfway across the globe from home. The specific location, I can't say but it's the kind of place where you learn to expect the unexpected. We had been sent in to handle a situation revolving around some dangerous, high-stakes stuff. I won't bore you with the details of our mission, primarily because I can't. All I can tell you is we needed to operate in a remote part of a dangerous territory, far removed from any accommodations or amenities that placate the Western man. I can't embellish the danger and hardships that come with the job, it's all part and parcel of what we sign up for. About two weeks into our deployment, we were en route to a new position. We had a convoy of four vehicles heading through some seriously onerous terrain. Imagine the worst road trip ever. Part bumpy roller coaster ride, part heated duck and cover drill. As we moved closer to our destination, even the normally jovial guys in the squad went quiet. You could cut the tension with a knife. Now Donovan, you need to know that when you're out there, functionally cut off from the real world, and stuck in the middle of nothing and nowhere, stories start floating around to bide time. Stories of ghostly figures standing watch, of strange voices whispering into radios in languages unheard of, of pranks that had us pissing our pants in terror. While these stories were entertaining, they were simply ghost stories, and I didn't lend much credence to them. That is, 
until what happened that night. I was in the third vehicle of our convoy, sitting shotgun next to our driver, Sanchez. He's a stocky guy, always chewing on an unlit cigar, his first form of an inside joke with himself about stereotypes. We were having a frustratingly mundane chat about an Italian pasta recipe his grandmother swore by when something strange happened. The lead vehicle's brake lights flash on and off, halting our ruggedized engines and leaving an unusual stillness. The radio crackled, and the commanding officer from the first vehicle ordered everyone to stay put while they scouted ahead. Something wasn't right, and we all felt it. Sanchez let out a low whistle, muttering a string of curses under his breath. This was supposed to be a routine patrol, the proverbial walk in the park, as Sanchez would have quipped. But that was far from what was shaping up. Ten agonizing minutes of silence followed, before our radio choked back to life. An erratic call to regroup, laced with a barely hidden note of panic. Again, details of our job require me to be discreet, but I can tell you, it's rare to hear that note in the voice of another Marine. We began to proceed forward slowly. In the flickering glow of our vehicle's headlights, the road ahead looked wrong, twisted somehow. Navigating past the first vehicle, we saw that it was off the road, tilted horribly into a ditch its remaining cracked headlight casting an ominous glow onto the fractured windshield. I felt a prickle of unease spread over me. The quietness that had descended was so out of place, so unnatural. Something was out there in the inky night, but what? I reached for my service rifle, checking the magazine by habit, my fingers finding cold solace in the familiar texture under them. Then came a low rumbling growl from the tall grass by the road. Something you'd hear from a predator, but much deeper. If fear had a sound, that was it. We braced as something moved, casting a monstrous scaled shadow on the headlight-drenched gravel. And then, all hell broke loose. My skin felt cold, and for the first time, I felt truly isolated and cut off from the world I knew. Then, from the shadows, emerged a figure that looked like it was ripped straight from the covers of science fiction novels. My hand reached instinctively for the dog tag around my neck, perhaps for consolation, assurance, or maybe even divine intervention. The creature standing in the halo of our vehicle's dim headlights was tall, easily seven, maybe even eight feet. It had a nightmare-inducing stare with piercing yellow eyes, the pupils slit-like and predatory, that seemed to evaluate us with an uncanny, chilling intelligence. Shadows danced over it as it moved. It was muscular, humanoid, but everything about it screamed extraterrestrial predator. Its skin reminded me of a snake, scales shimmering even in the dirt cast twilight. Splashes of dirt splotched the creature's hide, but from the look of it, no amount of mud could dampen the fear those fierce eyes inspired. It moved with a graceful, predatory caution that seemed at odds with its gargantuan size. A flash of a dark claw swung by its side, the sharp talons catching the light in a menacing gleam. There I sat, clutching my rifle with a white-knuckled grip. Pulling up every bit of guts I've ever gathered, I opened fire. There wasn't time for discussion or for rational thought. Everything was fight or flight, and in our line of work, flight isn't an option. The subsequent seconds were a ringing blur. I remember the deafening sound of gunfire the chaos of the frightened yells, and then, fear turning into disbelief as the creature, unflustered, dodged the bullets. In the blink of an eye, it had disappeared into the wilderness. The aftermath was frantic, a whirlwind of tense faces and nervous chuckles. We found ourselves looking over our shoulders for days after. It was an event that was never spoken of, a secret heavy in the air. Soldiers are trained not to fear the enemy, but what enemy did we face out there? I wish I had answers for you, Donovan. I wish I could tell you that it was just another tall tale from a night out in the field. But every time I run through that memory, I find myself questioning the shadows and listening a little closer for growls in the silent night. The world is so much larger, so much older, and so much more unnerving than we can ever fathom. I don't trust people that don't believe in the paranormal. How can you say spirits don't exist? It makes no sense to me. 
How can you be sure something you can't see isn't there? Anyways, I know you read paranormal experiences on your channel, so I'll tell you something that happened to me back when I was a park ranger. We had gotten all kinds of reports from campers and hikers of screams in this one section of the forest. People hear crazy things in the forest all the time, but we received over 40 accounts of hearing screams near this campsite. My partner and I grabbed our gear, got in the truck, and headed down the road. We decided to camp out there for the night, so we wouldn't miss anything. We started a fire, set up a couple of tents, brought some food, and we were in good shape. Even if we didn't get to the source of the notorious screaming, we were prepared to have a great night out camping. We grilled some steaks and sat around for a while, enjoying the peace. Then we heard a terrible scream coming from deep in the forest. We radioed in that we heard the scream and were going into the woods to investigate. We grabbed our flashlights and started making our way towards the scream. There wasn't much noise after that. We just took our time and slowly made our way deeper into the woods. The forest was weirdly quiet and it felt like something was wrong. We both stopped walking and just stood in the middle of the forest to see if we could hear anything. Suddenly, we heard a scream so loud that it hurt both of our ears. It wasn't like anything I ever heard before. It was human-like, but much more bellowing and with more of a growl to it. I looked to my left and I saw the most terrifying creature I've ever seen in my life. It was freakishly tall, standing on its hind legs and about seven feet tall. It had glowing blue eyes and looked like a wolf, but much larger and more muscular. Its face was menacing, like a cross between a wolf, an ape, and a demon. It charged right at me, and I dove out of the way to avoid being trampled to death. I heard gunshots, and when I looked, I saw my partner fire several rounds into the creature. It swung at my partner, and he jumped out of the way inches from being butchered. I shot it in the back of the head and it whipped around, looked me right in the eyes, and howled at me. I ran away as fast as I could towards the campsite and heard my partner screaming behind me. I couldn't just leave him back there to get mauled, so took off towards his cries. When I met back up with him, he was halfway up a tree and he pointed in the direction the creature ran off in. We both started running out of the forest and we heard the creature scream once again. It was still very much alive. We gathered up everything from the campsite, shoved it in the van, and got the hell out of there. When we were filing the report, we got a visit from a man in a suit from the U.S. Department of the Interior. When we told him what happened, he repeated the story back to us, but insisted that we report it as a rabid bear. We explained to him that it wasn't a bear. Its eyes glowed and it looked like a wolf and ape mix. We told him it was over seven feet tall and it screamed like a human. He simply nodded and then after a pause, he insisted again that the encounter we had was with a rabid bear. He also congratulated us on successfully killing the creature. I explained to him that we didn't kill it and it was still running wild in the forest. He then got very stern with me and said that if I valued my job, freedom, and life, I would put that we killed the rabid bear, causing all the issues. It was a disturbing moment. He ripped up the initial report and said that he looked forward to reading about what happened to us in the forest. Then he left. I was terrified and pissed off. There was something seriously dangerous in our backyard, and the government wouldn't let us get the help we need to get rid of it. It made me question all the information I've ever received in my entire life. If they're powerful enough to make the victims of a paranormal creature lie about what they saw, then what else were they capable of? They're in charge of our schools. What are they brainwashing children to believe? They censor information on the internet. What don't they want us to know? I lied on the report and so did my partner. Under threat of losing my job, being thrown in jail, and even being killed, we were forced to lie about the most traumatic moment of our lives. I quit shortly afterward, and I won't go near a government job ever again. If that happened to me, how many innocent people are out there getting bullied by the government? Is the government responsible for releasing a creature like that into the wild? I ask myself questions that keep me up at night, and I wish this never happened to me. But it did happen to me, and I am forever changed as a result. What do you think it was, Donovan? Any insight would be greatly appreciated. 
Thanks for sharing the stories that the governing forces out there don't want us to know. I have something absolutely terrifying to share. This happened three months ago behind my house in western Pennsylvania. I had a few friends over on a Saturday evening and we were all hanging out in my backyard having a cornhole tournament. I recently got really into cornhole and so did a few of my friends so we play now every chance we get. I spent so much money on different kinds of bags you wouldn't believe. Anyways, it's about 8 p.m. and we had been playing for a few hours and having some drinks when we started hearing this really weird noise come from the back of my property. We were playing under the lights because I have a big old spotlight in my backyard so we can play late at night. Now I'm a hunter and so are a lot of my friends and we all hear this noise and no one recognizes what it could be. I don't even know if I could describe it, but imagine a bullfrog mixed with a gorilla. I know that sounds batshit crazy, but that's the best I can describe it. I know it doesn't make any sense and we felt the same way, but we kept hearing it so my one buddy John thought it was a good idea to go in the woods and see if we can find what is making this sound. There was four of us who decided to go looking and I grabbed a spotlight and we set off into the woods. Now when we were playing cornhole, it sounded like this thing was maybe 40 to 50 yards away, as best as I could tell. We are in the woods about where I thought it was coming from and now the sound is even further away. So we go in further and the sound is moving like it's either trying to get away or trying to bait us in for a trap. Well, it was certainly the latter because what happens next is why we don't play cornhole at my house anymore. My friend John shouts out to the group, Hey, look right there. We see this thing because I don't know what to call it. This yellowish hairless creature standing behind the trees with these claws wrapped around the front of the tree like it was hugging it. As soon as John said that, this thing jumps out from behind the tree and starts making these crazy sounds coming from the back of its throat. It had this rectangular head and very deep set eyes that were glowing red. The creature was something straight out of a scary movie. It was as tall as a basketball hoop, its bare yellow skin shining in our flashlight's beam. The skin was smooth, hairless, and kind of shiny, making it look really weird and creepy. Its claws were just as scary. Long black and curved like a hawk's talons, they looked like they could rip through anything. They were attached to long, finger-like hands that reminded me of tree branches. The creature's arms were big and strong, much larger than a normal person's, and ended in these freaky hands. The creature's head was rectangle-shaped, which was really strange. It had no hair and no ears that we could see. The eyes were the scariest part. They were set deep in its head, glowing bright red like two burning embers. When I looked into those eyes, it felt like this thing was super old and super smart, like it knew things we didn't. Its mouth was wide and filled with sharp yellow teeth. It looked like it could easily bite through a steak. The weird noises we'd heard were coming from this creature, sounding even louder and scarier now. The noises echoed through the quiet woods, making me shiver. The way this creature moved was just as freaky. It was really quiet and smooth like a cat stalking its prey. Every step it took was so silent and smooth, it seemed almost like a dance. This thing looked like it was used to moving in the dark, and it was really good at it. Now, it was moving towards us. Suddenly, the fun of playing cornhole and hanging out in my backyard seemed a million miles away. We were in the middle of the woods, facing this terrifying creature, and it was the scariest moment of my life. The moment seemed to stretch forever, and then suddenly the creature leapt towards us. Its jump was long and high, like some super-powered kangaroo. We didn't have time to think. Instinct took over and we all started running. We ran as fast as we could, the woods becoming a blur around us. The creature's monstrous cries echoed through the night, sounding closer and closer. My heart pounded like a drum in my chest. I could hear my friends panting, their heavy breaths matching the rhythm of our frantic footsteps. In the panic, I lost my grip on the spotlight and it fell, plunging us into darkness. 
All we could see were the shadows of the trees and the glowing red eyes of the creature chasing us. It was like a nightmare come to life. We finally broke through the edge of the woods, stumbling onto the open ground of my backyard. The bright lights from the house seemed welcoming and comforting after the terrifying darkness. We didn't stop though. We kept running, heading straight for the safety of the house. Bursting through the back door, we slammed it shut and locked it. Our heavy breaths were the only sounds in the silent house. We peered out the window, half expecting to see those glowing red eyes staring back at us. But there was nothing there, just the peaceful quiet night. The creature had stopped at the edge of the woods, a shadowy figure barely visible in the darkness. We didn't dare to go back outside that night, and I don't think any of us slept. We just stayed in the living room, jumping at every sound, waiting for the sun to rise. The next day we found the cornhole boards overturned and the bags scattered everywhere. The backyard looked like a storm had swept through it, but the woods were quiet. The creature was gone. And so our late night cornhole games ended. We still hang out, but now we do it inside, safe behind locked doors. As for the creature, we never saw it again. But sometimes late at night, I think I can hear that strange noise coming from the woods. And I shudder, remembering those glowing red eyes. I had taken up trail running to try to get in better shape. I had been an avid hiker my entire life, but my metabolism dropped like a rock in my mid-twenties and my leisurely hikes just weren't cutting it anymore. I'm a very goal-oriented person, so I set myself a goal of running at least one mile every day. No matter what. I hadn't missed a day since I started in the spring and I was feeling better than ever. Even when it was pouring rain, I ran at least a mile. There was a great state park about 10 miles away from my house. The trails were well maintained and well marked. Some were in the forest and others were along these rolling prairies. All the trails were color coded and ranked by difficulty at the trailheads. Spring and summer went great, but we were moving into fall now. I still maintained my goal of running at least one mile per day, but the days were getting shorter and I found myself running in the dark after work on weeknights. I wouldn't say I'm afraid of the woods after dark, but I usually got my mile in and then went home. I would run longer on weekends to make up for it. There were really only two trails that were short enough for my after work runs. The red trail and the purple trail. The red trail goes through dense forests and had some significant inclines while the purple trail was fairly flat and followed along the edge of a very lazy river. My daily goal was a mile. A mile of hills or a flat mile. It didn't matter. A mile was a mile. So more often than not, I ended up on the purple trail. The purple trail was an out and back trail with a small loop on the very end. Like a lollipop. An easy mile. I had never experienced anything strange there before. I was always a bit uneasy after dark, but mostly because I couldn't see other people until I was right next to them. I would take my headphones out so I could hear better. During my daylight runs, I always kept them on. One day, I was running along the purple trail and listening to the sounds of the nearby river. The sun was setting, but hadn't gotten totally dark yet. It would be dark on my way back, but I still had a tiny bit of light left. The first thing I noticed was the smell. There was a sudden putrid smell that seemed to come out of nowhere. It's hard to describe. It was musty, maybe moldy smelling, kind of like rotting fruit or garbage. It didn't smell like a dead animal or anything like that, but it was pretty unpleasant. I just sort of held my breath and ran past it. I had to do that sometimes when dead fish would wash up along the riverbank. The downsides of hiking next to rivers. I left the smell behind as I continued my run. I knew I would have to go back that way and I hoped it was gone by the time I returned. I didn't notice anything off or strange the rest of my run, but when I returned to the spot with the smell, it had grown even worse. I could barely get past it without gagging. It smelled like a wet garbage dump right in the middle of the forest. Also, it was darker now. The only light came from my headlamp, cutting through the darkness, but not quite reaching far enough to see anything. 
Eventually it got so bad that I stopped and looked around trying to find the source of the smell. Then my heart skipped a beat. Up in the trees I saw two eyes shining back at me, reflecting the light from my headlamp. The eyes were maybe 30 feet away from me. At first I was caught off guard surprised by what I saw, but I quickly told myself that it was just an animal. After all, I was in the forest and animals lived here. However, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Then I heard it move. The sound was loud and heavy and I could hear the tree limb cracking underneath its weight. Whatever it was, it was enormous. I saw the branches shake as the creature seemed to come down the tree. My mind immediately jumped to the conclusion that it was a bear. Bears could be dangerous, especially if surprised, so I knew I had to act quickly. I recalled what I had learned about dealing with black bears. Standing my ground, I started yelling and waving my arms to look bigger and more threatening. My heart was pounding in my chest, but I kept my light pointed at the creature trying to make out what it was. Then something strange happened. As the creature came into view, I noticed its fur. It wasn't the dark black of a bear, but rather a gray, shaggy coat. The more I looked, the more wolf-like it appeared, but that didn't make sense. Wolves didn't climb trees and they certainly didn't smell like garbage dumps. This was something else, something wild and unfamiliar. Fear and curiosity mixed within me as I continued to watch the creature. It moved with a strange grace, powerful and yet cautious. Its eyes never left mine and I could feel a connection, a primal understanding between us. But I also felt a warning, a sense that I was close to something unknown and dangerous. I took a step back, still watching the wolf-like creature. I ran all the way back to the parking lot, got in my car and locked the doors. I was terrified and out of breath, so I sat in my car for a moment to regain some composure. It was a moment too long because I started to smell that smell again. I put the car in drive and tore out of the parking lot, but before I got back on the road, I had to turn towards the trailhead. My headlights pointed straight down the center of the trail I came from, and I saw the flash of eyes reflected back in my headlights. I didn't stay to get a better look at it. I drove out of there as fast as I could and never went back. To this day, I've never run in that park again. Hey Donovan, one hell of a story to share. Writing from Yellowstone National Park here. Been working as a park ranger for about two years now. Always loved the outdoors, so I thought this was the perfect job for me. Keep the park clean, make sure visitors are safe. You know the drill. Yellowstone's not all just old faithful and magnificent landscapes though. It's got its share of the wild and the weird. But the story I'm about to tell you trumps everything I've ever experienced here. So, I was just doing my routine rounds one late afternoon, checking for any lost items, mending some of the older trail signs, the usual. Anyway, I walked past one of our old field offices that we didn't use anymore. An old wooden hut must have been built in the 60s or 70s. It was always locked up tight and we're not given access to it. I mean, why would anyone care about an old beat up shack, right? But that day, I noticed the door ajar. Curiosity got the best of me and I decided to check it out, thinking it might just be kids messing around or some wild animal that had found its way in. That's where I stumbled upon these old files, covered in a thick layer of dust, shoved in a beaten up filing cabinet. The most intriguing of all files was this one that contained a detailed underground map. Now, I know the layout of this park like the back of my hand, but this map, it made no sense. It showcased large chambers, corridors, entire structures located deep beneath the park areas. Give me a moment to paint this visual for you. Imagine a huge mind map turned into an old school Dungeons and Dragons dungeon sketch. Only these were no dungeons. The strange map details were annotated with distances, exact coordinates, and, the weirdest part, containment cell numbers. It was like something out of a sci-fi horror movie. A creepy water-stained yellowed map marking an underground facility that no one in the park management knew existed. There was this faint scent to the map. Off-putting, sour, bit like rotten eggs, I reckon. Can't really put a finger on it, it was quite bowl over. Right after I'd studied the map more closely, 
I started to hear this low, deep sound coming from below the shack. A grumble. Kind of like a moan morphing into a long, drawn-out growl. Now I've heard a fair share of wild animal sounds. Lived around them long enough. But this, Donovan, this was something completely different. Deeper. Scarier. It reverberated through the shack. Stronger with each passing second. Just as this chilling sound wrapped up its eerie symphony, there was a knock that echoed through the chambers. A loud, thrumming knock. One that makes you feel like you're on the edge of a long-forgotten abyss. The map, the sound, the knock. Everything seemed to conjoin into creating this unsettling feeling in the pit of my stomach. I felt an overwhelming strangeness, a feeling I wish upon no one. Decided to call it a day and make a swift exit from the shack. On one of the future occasions, I decided to ask my supervisor about the old field office and what it might have housed in the past. I decided to dig deeper into this mystery. Now, I wasn't exactly part of an X-Files episode, but I pretty much felt like it. I followed that old map and it led me into the belly of Yellowstone, to places not seen by casual visitors or even most of my fellow park rangers. Not gonna lie to you, I was nervous as all hell. The place had an eerie vibe to it. The deeper I went, the worse the smell got. Really putrid, like old rotten garbage. It was damp and cold, and darker than night itself. My flashlight did little to pierce the gloom, but I carried on. I made my way through husky corridors, across damp earth, under cobweb-laden arches. Not gonna lie, the ambience was unnerving, and couple that with the low moaning sound I could hear from deep within. Not quite the outdoor adventure I had in mind. Okay, worst part? I felt like I wasn't alone. Like I kept hearing this huffing noise. Like a large animal. Now I'd say I was used to dealing with animals during my day-to-day -day work. But this? This felt different. Worse, because that huffing was followed by this guttural sort of grunting sound. That's when I saw it. My flashlight beam illuminated a massive shape. I nearly dropped the flashlight as it reflected off red fur. I'd seen loads of animals out in the wild, Donovan, but I ain't ever encountered anything that tall and hulking in my life. The damn thing had to be at least eight feet tall. It was bulky, powerful, the kind of beast that could uproot trees and men alike with relative ease. Its head towered fluorescently in my flashlight. Its facial features were hard to make out in the dull light, but it had a pronounced forehead a pronounced jawline, deep-set eyes, and a broad cheek. But the worst was its smell, a vile combination of spoiled meat and damp earth. Now, I've heard stories, of course. Every seasoned outdoorsman has. Stories of the Sasquatch. But those are just tales spun by campfires and in the corners of old man bars. But standing that close to such a monster staring at it, I was frozen with fear. In the next few moments, the beast let out a prolonged howl. So loud and deep, it froze my blood. It sent shivers down my spine. And then, it was just gone. It banged the ground hard one time, like a warning knock, before rushing off into the outward darkness. I didn't stick around to see if it was going to return. I shot out of there like a rocket, determined to see daylight again. When I finally broke through from the depths back into reality, I almost kissed the ground. Since then, I've been wrestling with this experience. What did I see? What's hiding beneath Yellowstone? Where do I go from here? I'm looking over my shoulder, questioning my role here every day since this encounter. Living and working in Yellowstone National Park has never been the same for me. But one thing's for sure, though. The park's image of picturesque landscapes and simmering geysers might be just the top layer of something far more surreal and wild that we ever thought. Till next time, Donovan, wish me luck, Stan.